But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, and this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standards. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he, he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus, Christ, Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when held back and he did not punish those who sinned in times past, for he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness for himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Can we boost then that we have done every, anything to be accepted by God? No, because our, our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. After all, is it God, the God of Jews only? Isn't he also the God of the Gentiles? Of course, he is. There is only one God, and he makes people right with himself only by faith, whether they are Jews or Gentiles. Well then, if we emphasize faith, does this mean that we can forget about the law? Of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. That's the word of God. This is our last, our last week looking at Romans, at least for the next uh, couple of months. It's been several weeks, and when we started, I need to move this up a bit so I can see the screen. When we started in Romans in chapter one, we got a glimpse of the mountaintop. We got a glimpse of the peak, which this one happens to be Mount Denali in Alaska, and it's just as beautiful as it looks. When we read in chapter one, we got a glimpse of the peak, the scripture that says, in the next slide, it says, I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight, and it goes by faith from start to finish. Good news, promised at the beginning. This is the mountain peak that you get a glimpse of far in the distance. But then... The very next verse is like getting lost in a blizzard or lost in the fog. This is also at Mount Denali, this uh, picture of them struggling through the fog. The next verse says, God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And so we had several weeks of talking about sin and judgment, and I tried to show some of the good news that's uh, included in that, the fact that there is a judge, that there is a right and wrong, but it's not exactly like hearing the good news. It's not exactly like looking at the mountain peak. We saw the last couple of weeks, we cannot judge, we cannot condemn others. We all stand equally condemned, condemned as sinful people. So uh, in, this, in this fog, but the mountain peak is still there, there is good news coming. And today, finally, we turn the corner, the clouds open up, the sun shines, and there's the mountain same mountain but now it's up close and it fills the whole sky and you get to hear the good news of God's grace 
God's kindness and his forgiveness. The passage that we just heard, that Moses read for us, begins with these two words, but now. But now. There were all these things are true. All these things that we have talked about, they are all true. But now, hear the good news. But now, God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. So there's a famous preacher from uh, the United Kingdom who said there are no more wonderful words in the whole of Scripture than just these two words, but now. After all that you've suffered, all that you've struggled with, after all this talk in, in the first chapters of Romans about sin, it's all true, but now. God has done something new. But now the door is opened. And what is this but now? What does that mean? What is this mountain that has suddenly come into view? What is this that we are now looking at? Well, in the past, there was a covenant that God made with Moses, through Moses, with his people of Israel. And a covenant is a promise or a way of interacting with God, is a way of approaching God. And this covenant that God made with Moses included the Ten Commandments, which is God's good design for human life. These are good expressions of God's will. The covenant with Moses also included these markers of identity for the Jewish people. Circumcision, observing the Sabbath, laws about what uh, food they eat, what clothes they wear. And it also included ceremonies regarding sacrifices and uncleanness and washing themselves and things like this. These are all included in the Law of Moses. And again, these are good expressions of God's will. The problem is not in the law. The problem is in us, in the people who are intended to put this into practice. We saw last week, the law does not save. The law only makes us more aware that we fall short. The more laws, the more rules, the more resolutions you make, the more you realize you're not fulfilling them. So this makes our sin obvious, and it's confirmed in what we read today. Everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious sin, and we may as well admit it. We may as well say, this is the truth about me, not just about other people. We all have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. So we got a glimpse of the mountain, but it's hidden in the fog. But now, but now, God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. Without keeping this covenant that God made with his people through Moses, there is now a new way of approaching God. There is a new way to be right with God, to be accepted and forgiven. And the law and the prophets, Moses himself and the prophets who came after, they pointed forward to this. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we just read. One example, and there are many, the prophet Jeremiah. Through the prophet Jeremiah, hundreds of years before Jesus, the prophet says, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. God says, I'm going to make a new covenant. It's not going to be like the one I made with Moses when I set my people free from slavery in Egypt. That covenant was good, but God says, I'm going to do something different. And Jeremiah goes on to describe, he says, I will write my law on their hearts 
saying their desire will be changed. They will want to serve me. They will know me deep within and their sins will be forgiven. And it also is about relationship. He says, I will be their God and they will be my people. There was this law of Moses because of sin. It was not effective in truly bringing us close to God. So God promised this new covenant. Before people approach God through this way, but now, but now through the new covenant in Jesus Christ, we can approach God. How does this new covenant work? How does this new promise work? First, is that it works by faith. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Your faith is enough. Your faith is enough. Not because faith itself is something that God looks at and says, you have enough faith? It's not some other good work that you must perform. It's looking away from yourself. Not that your faith is enough, but that Jesus is enough. The grace of God is enough. The second way this works is by grace. God in his grace freely makes us right within his sight. God's goodness and kindness. This is how it works. God freely makes us right in his sight. And the third thing which I've already hinted at is that it is works by it works through Jesus. How does this work? He did this through Jesus Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life shedding his blood. This is how it works. And now you see all this included in the law of Moses, the covenant that God gave through Moses, including ceremonies and sacrifices. It's all fulfilled in Jesus. The final and full sacrifice for sins. Jesus is enough. And all that we must do is put our trust in him. And when we do so, God makes us right with himself. It works by faith. It works by grace through Jesus Christ. As we sing, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. In some ways it may seem easier all I have to do is believe in Jesus. It's true, it's simple, it's clear. But the other half, as we also sang, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. God has bought our whole life for himself. And this is how it works. By faith, by trust in Jesus, we are made into new people. We are made into people who become like Christ himself. What this means for us, all this that happened in the past, but now God has done something different. But now you can stand in God's presence forgiven and free. What it means is that uh, the things that we've mentioned in the past, just last week I said sin is breaking a rule or crossing a line, and that is true. And when a person crosses the line or breaks a rule, there is a sense of guilt which we feel in our conscience, it weighs on us at times. You know you shouldn't do something and you do it anyways and the feeling afterwards is feeling of guilt. Well, we are free from guilt because 
we are forgiven. The technical word for this that we don't see in this translation of the Bible that we use is simpler language, but the technical word is that we are justified, which is a word that comes from the, the, the courts of law. And a person goes before the judge and the judge declares them in their terms justified. In English, in America at least, you go before a judge and they say guilty or not guilty. A judge in this time would declare somebody righteous, justified, in the right. And God declares those who believe in Jesus Christ justified, righteous. You are right with God. And so the guilt is taken away. The guilt is removed. And there is a second word that, you may, that we've, we've mentioned. Through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This is referring back again to this system of bringing sacrifices of animals in the, in the temple. And once, one day a year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies the one place that all throughout the year was off limits, the very presence of God on earth in the center of the temple. And this high priest would take a sacrifice for the sins of himself and all the people. In the book of Hebrews it says, Jesus Christ enters the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, and he himself is the high priest and he himself is the sacrifice. Through Jesus, our new high priest, through Jesus, our sacrifice for sin, we are forgiven. And our guilt is removed. Some of us have lived for a long time with a sense of guilt for a long time with a sense of guilt. And you need to hear these words. But now, you are made right with God through Jesus Christ. You are forgiven. This also means for us, similar to guilt, but there's also another sense that we call shame. And you see this in the very first story of the Bible as God has created the world and the first human beings, God gave them one rule only, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which represents to them to become like God. And when they eat from this tree, as they do, God has not said anything, nobody has said anything, but it describes them before it says the man and the woman were naked and they were not ashamed. And in the Bible, sometimes the word naked doesn't just mean they had no clothes on, but it means they were open and vulnerable with nothing to hide. The kind of relationship you want in a marriage, right? And they were naked before one another and before God. Nothing to hide, nothing to be afraid of. But as soon as they eat the fruit, it says their eyes were opened, they realized they were naked, and they felt ashamed. And we all know this same experience. You don't have to be caught to already feel the shame. Nobody has to say anything you already feel within you. So you think, I think there's a slide that shows these two verses here. Hmm. Maybe I missed it. Go back, Isaac. Thank you. You're free from shame. There are some, I just heard about this on, on was reminded of this on Friday at a seminar in in Luva, that there are some cultures that are built on guilt and innocence 
and look to the courts to decide who is guilty and who is innocent. Uh, this is You see this in the United States and Europe all the time. Things that are being said about people, all sorts of accusations about uh, sexual assault is constantly in the news right now. And people say, this person is guilty. They did wrong. There are other societies, other cultures that are built more on a sense of honor and shame. And that when somebody does something that is wrong, it is seen as something that brings shame on themselves and an entire family. And the family then sometimes wants to distance themselves from that person so that the shame does not come onto the family. And either mindset creates fear when we bring that into our relationship with God. I'm guilty and God will judge me. I'm shameful and God will reject me. Both of them are removed through Jesus Christ. Guilt is removed and your shame is taken away. Everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Another way to say this is we all fall short of God's glorious presence. And glory is another way of expressing honor. And if you don't share God's glory, God's honor, then what does that mean? You experience shame. And yet it says, God freed us from the penalty. He redeemed us. This is a word that was used for buying back a person who had become a slave or somebody who had become a prisoner of war. And to redeem them means I will buy them back and make them my own. And God has bought you back and made you his own so that you are no longer rejected. You are brought close through Jesus Christ. So some of us have lived for many long years with a sense of shame, feeling I'm unworthy, I cannot be loved. You even feel that you hate yourself. But now, you are made right with God through Jesus Christ. Let these words sink in. Your guilt is forgiven. Your shame is removed. You are made a son or a daughter of God himself. We're also free from fear. Martin Luther was the man who started the Protestant Reformation. He was a Catholic monk, one of the most serious monks there has ever been. He gave himself completely to the prayers, the confession, visiting his priest, his confessor, and wanted to confess every sin. And he would leave, and 10 minutes later, he would realize, there's one more thing that I didn't remember, and now I need to go back and confess it. But all his confessing, all his praying, all his everything that he did, all his actions, he never felt peace. And when he would read the Bible, and he would think about God, actually he realized he hated God. He was terrified of God. He would read in Romans where it talks about the righteous. Those who are righteous by faith will live. And his first he read the word righteous and he thought, I am not righteous. I cannot stand before God. And he was terrified. Until eventually he read Romans another time. And passages like this, and when it says those who are righteous will live by, righteous by faith will live, then he realized to be righteous by faith in Jesus Christ, by putting our faith in Jesus, we are accepted by God. Then suddenly everything changed. And Martin Luther, he said, here I felt as if I were entirely born again and had entered paradise itself through the gates that had been flung open. When we know the love of God that is given to us in Jesus Christ, it takes away all fear, <coughs> guilt, and shame. And there are some of us who for many long years have, been, have this feeling of fear. What will happen when I stand before God? But now, you can know you are forgiven, your shame is removed, and you are accepted by God who loves you. I want to say something especially to those 
of you who wrestle with these things, guilt, shame, fear. You've put your faith in Jesus, you are seeking God, and yet you still feel this struggle. You wrestle with guilt and shame and fear. I remember what a guy, uh, a friend of mine told me that he learned back in university. He said he remembered seeing this train, and I wanted to bring this, it's a little simple illustration, that what drives the train is not the way you feel. What drives the train is the fact. And the fact in this case is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Did that occur? Did Jesus die? And did he die for your sins? Yes, that is a fact. Following on that is our faith. I believe that. He died for me. Following that come the feelings. And when we get this in the right order, we recognize Jesus died for me. Then the feelings, how I feel today, I feel guilty. I feel ashamed. I feel afraid. Oh well, Jesus died for me. You see the freedom that there is in knowing that you are justified and knowing that you are forgiven and knowing that Jesus died for you. In fact, it says... Uh, one of the, the letters the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, a great little saying, he says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Because God cannot deny himself. This is who God is for all time. He is faithful. Our acceptance by God does not depend on us being so good or even so faithful. It depends on God's faithfulness. So you can put your mind and your heart at rest. Another thing, a fourth thing this means is that we are free not only from guilt and shame and fear, but we are free on the other side. There are people who do pretty good with religion, do pretty good with rules, do pretty good at pleasing others, and they can become a little bit proud. I'm good. I'm better. I have all of this in order. And this pride creates what we call boasting, pointing to yourself. Look at what I've done. Look at what I have accomplished. And we see this verse in chapter 3. It says, Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal, our being justified and set free, is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So he says there's no ground, there's no reason to be proud. There's no reason to boast or point to yourself for what you've accomplished because it has nothing to do with us. You're pointing to Jesus Christ, your Savior. He is my salvation. So if you're going to boast, if you're going to be proud, all you can boast about is Jesus. In fact, there's a verse repeated a few times in the Bible. Let the person who boasts, boast in the Lord. Uh, so it takes away the reason for boasting, the reason for pride, and it is such a relief too. If you're trying to make yourself feel better than others, it's such hard work. Constantly comparing yourself to others, competing with others. You look at somebody who looks better in some ways, and then you have to either lift yourself up, well, I'm at least as good, I'm better in other ways, or else you bring them down. You say, yeah, but I bet they have some hidden part of their life that is going to bring them down someday. And it's such a relief to be done with that, and just to forget about yourself and just delight in Jesus Christ. And I say this by my own personal experience. It is a relief to lay pride and boasting aside. But now, some of us have been in that place, but now, there's no reason for pride or boasting. We are also free to fulfill the law. This came up at the end of what we said. Next, uh, next slide. It says, well then, if we emphasize faith, does this mean that we can forget about the law? 
And we're not justified. We're not made right with God through the law. It's by faith. So can we just forget everything about the law? He says, of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. The law is simplified and clarified when we follow Jesus. He says it's summed up in two things. Love God with everything that you have and love other people as yourself. And when we follow Jesus, we, we, when we baptized people a few weeks ago, we said, you're dying to sin and you're being raised to new life. And this new person, this new creation, has a desire to please God. And we are becoming more and more like Christ. So before the law was something that condemned you, that revealed sin, but now it is your delight to honor God by the way that you live, to celebrate. After going a long time without something, when you receive it, it makes you so joyful. I'm going to show an example in a video. This explorer from Norway who went to the South Pole on foot and he spent three months alone in the cold, pr uh, practically starving, and along the way to the South Pole he left these, uh, he stored food. Hold on. <laughs> Along the way, he stored food under the, uh, in, in these different spots, and by about day 90, well, day, day 86, you see, he's getting to the last place where he has left food, and he's gone 86 days, just barely surviving alone in the cold and the dark and all these things, and he doesn't even remember what food he's left there. So he's pulling it out, and you can kind of understand one word of, uh, out of a few of these in, Nor in Norwegian, and he says, I w hope I win the lottery. And you need to see his response. Do you need food to live every day? Do you need food? So when you, when you open up the cupboard and there's bread in there, do you rejoice? Do you give thanks to God that there is bread? You need to look how this man responds and think the same way. Do you need God's grace and his love in your life? And when you hear that God loves you, do you rejoice? Do you throw a party the way this guy throws a party? Let's show this. It goes on. He finds Mentos and he falls on the ground. He can't even stop. Mentos. Candy. Ah, when you've gone all this time with guilt and shame and fear and you hear you are made right with God by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, it feels like that. And maybe you just needed to be reminded, God loves you. Jesus gave his life for you. And you can shout and you can scream and you can rejoice because it is true. I heard, his, heard a, guy, a story from this guy personally back in California. He had problems with drug addiction and, and divorce and all, I mean, all sorts of problems just through his whole life and violence and suffering. And somebody invited him to a church service and he said, fine, I'll go. I have nothing to lose. And he sits through the whole service and at the end he's invited forward and the pastor says, I'll pray for you. And the man says, no, I'll pray for myself. And he calls on the name of Jesus and he says, if you are real, I want to know. And if it's true you died for me, I want to know this. And if it's true that you love me, I want to know. And what he experienced in that moment was so powerful. He ran out into the street and shouted and yelled, it's true, there is a God. And Jesus is real. It was so all his life, all the suffering and struggling and everything, but now I know the love of Jesus Christ. Let's turn to him together in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for this fact that Christ has died for us. We praise you. We give you honor and glory that we are accepted by putting our faith in your son Jesus. We turn to him now. And for those people who still feel this burden of guilt or shame or fear 
overwhelm those things with the presence of your Holy Spirit. Give them assurance that they are accepted and welcomed by you and they are adopted as your sons and daughters. Make us also free from boasting and from pride. There is no pride when we come to you humbly and putting our faith in Jesus Christ. We give you glory, Lord. And for anybody here who for the first time is saying, I need to know this. I need to give my life to Jesus. You know their heart. You hear their prayer. Confirm this decision by sending your Holy Spirit. Confirm by giving assurance. And by giving now a greater hunger for you. We pray all this through Christ your Son. Amen.